Um, okay, that's what we're looking at tonight, the school of Peshischa. Um, and whew, this is a very difficult class uh, to prepare um, because it is, uh, what we're gonna look at tonight is, is, is a major turning point in the development of Hasidic thought. We've, set, we've sort of been setting all of the, the foundations up and, and I think we have a pretty good understanding uh, of the basics of like the Hasidic movement as it emerged, what it, what it birthed unto the world. Um, the, the school of Peshischa, which we're gonna look at tonight, is, a, is, a, is in some ways the major turning point in, in the development of, of Hasidic thought. It's a little bit like um, the Reformation right in christianity it's like there's something about it that represents a kind of a rejection of everything that's come before it um but a kind of a, a pious rejection a kind of a yeah uh a, a holy a holy rebellion as um as as rabbi uh mickey or michael rosen calls it i relied very very heavily on this book the quest for authenticity the thought of Rav of Chambodim. i'll i'll uh i'll put the link to that in the chat the rabbi who wrote it it's a it's a beautiful book it's very lyrical it's it, not the best for research in some ways because it's almost like he has a very poetic style of writing but um this is a rabbi who found who founded the shul not ikar but yakar in in jerusalem and himself was a very like a uh, an english rabbi who made uh, aliyah to israel and was just very consumed by his own spiritual journey um, and, 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 and was very much inspired by uh, one, of the, one of the figures we're going to look at tonight, Rav Sim Um Okay, there's three figures that we're going to look at tonight. There were, there were three major rabbis in Peshischa, and, um, and they represent a kind of a school or a kind of a Hasidic, short-lived Hasidic dynasty, um, but what makes this class so difficult is that it's so important, so critical for understanding what Hasidic thought is all about. And yet there's very, very little uh, material that not, none of those three rabbis wrote a thing down. And, you know, we're used to it, right? The Baal Shem Tov didn't write anything down. It's everybody's writing um, their, the, the stories of their teachers down. Um, but here it's really thin, really thin. There isn't... Um, um, there isn't uh, uh, any kind of record of their Torah. The ones that we, uh, the, the, the scraps that we do have are disputed in their authenticity. Um, and, uh, and so what ends up, what we end up getting from the school and what they end up being known for are like, are, are sayings and quotations and kind of aphorisms that are quite striking, but a little hard to, um, to decipher out of, out of context. Um, that's especially true for the Kutzka Rebbe. Probably of the three, the last, the Kutzka Rebbe is like, is, is the most famous, and he kind of represents the Hasidic master with the pithy saying, the, the three-word saying that devastates, right? We'll get to him eventually. Um, but, um, but the point is, you know, even in this book, he says, you know, he says that all the sources are unreliable, and so what you have to do is kind of put together a kind of a composite from all the sources, get a sense of, because we know there was a school of Peshischa, and we know that, um, in fact, in, in its height, it was, it became the, the maybe the most dominant school in, in Hasidic thought. Um, and we know that there were these three rabbis, and we then have, um, there many of their descendants, they, they, they spawned a whole series of schools um, of rabbis that are very prominent. One of them we'll study next week, um, Rabbi uh, Mordechai Yosef Leiner of Ishvitz, the Ishvitz Rebbe. Um, and another one is very famous, the Sfas Ms, the, the, the mo one, of the, one of the more modern Hasidic thinkers who's just a master, descends from this lineage. Okay, lineage is really important here. So uh, let's, let's, uh, let's take a look for a second at lineage. And let me give you, uh, the source sheet that we're going to be looking at tonight. 
And when I say source sheet, I feel a little sheepish because uh, I'm a text guy. I, you know, I all I all I really feel expert in is looking at Torah texts and analyzing them. And so even in our our coverage of earlier Hasidic masters, I didn't do a lot of the biographical sociological because that's just not my area. I tried to get into like the the nitty gritty of their work. Um, but in this cl in this uh, uh, class, as I've already said, it's a little bit hard to say that any of this is is their, the text. And, and oh, I just put it in, but it seems like it doesn't have a link. I'm going to put it in again. I guess you have to copy and paste that. For some reason, some of them seem to link and some of them don't. I'll fix it. I'm going to send another one. Okay. Um, yeah, the, if you look at the source sheet that I just sent, um, I, I haven't even included the Hebrew because there is no Hebrew. It doesn't matter. None of this was written in Hebrew. In fact, I guess most of these stories are written in Yiddish. So, you know, it's no, we're not going to be analyzing text in the same way that we usually do. Um, and I wouldn't get too attached to the words. All these stories are versions of stories that have been told a hundred times. Um, but the ideas are important. And as I say, uh, critically important in some ways for, under, for coming to understand what Hasidus is all about, because so far we've been talking, and uh, this is the last sort of um, word of introduction, and that, and that so far we've been talking theology, and I, and I called this class the psychological turn. And if, that's, if there's any way to sort of um, foreground what we're going to be talking about, it's that turn. There's something about this school that represents a kind of a going inward and really thinking about human psychology as opposed to what is God? How do you know God? Like what's our place in the world? Okay. Okay. So um, it's really important here, I think, uh, especially to, uh, to look at lineage. So let's take a look at lineage. Uh, I, I even wrote it out on the source sheet because I just felt like it's, this is something we need to really take account of. It, there's a significance here, not just to the break, but to the lineage itself. Okay, so there's Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, right? The Baal Shem Tov, the start, starts Hasidut, we know, we know that guy. And then we also spend a lot of time with uh, his chief student, Rav Dov Bear, the Magad of Mezrich, right? And the Rav Dov Bear, as I've said, almost every class developed this little circle around him, the Chavraya Kaddish, the Holy Circle. And we studied three of those thinkers, the founder of Chabad, the uh, Balatanya, the Kedushat Levi, the great um, defender of Israel, lover of Israel. And the other one we studied, the first actually that we studied, was Rav Eli Melech of Lezhinsk. Now, uh, do you remember what we studied with Rav Eli Melech? What was his central Torah, the, the idea that he represented more than any other Hasidic thinker? I'll do some of you do. Um, the concept, the doctrine, more than the concept, but the doctrine of the tzaddik, the righteous man, which um, we have sometimes translated as like the guru because the tzaddik becomes the, the one who is so righteous that you go to the tzaddik. You seek a uh, blessing from the tzaddik. You want to be close to the tzaddik. And as Rav Eli Melech tells it, the tzaddik is capable of that and is negotiating all kinds of spiritual forces on your behalf and is, is, is every bit a holy man, right? In the, in the sort of touched sense of, of that. Okay, so that's Rav Eli Melech of Lezhinsk. And so it is important to note that the break happens uh, in, in the next generation. Because Rav Elimelech's chief student was uh, a, a fellow by the name of Yaakov Yitzchak, who became known as the, 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 the Jose of Lublin, the seer of Lublin. Jose is like a word that you use for prophets. Okay? The seer of Lublin. So that already should tell you something. Like, whoa, they're calling this guy a, a seer? You know, a, a, a prophet? Uh, so, so just to like set the stage a little bit, Reveli Melech passes away and his chief student is um, Rabbi Yaakov, Yaakov Yitzchak of, Lu, of Lublin. And what happens um, by the end of the 18th century is that this guy, the Jose, Jose Mi Lublin, becomes the absolutely dominant um, Hasidic force or personality in, in Poland and spreading throughout Eastern Europe. Um, this is really the first 
um, we sometimes speak of Hasidic courts, you know, like a kind of a, a realm run by a Rebbe. And the Chosani Lublin was that guy, was the guy that, um, that people flock to that really was like a, like a pilgrimage, like you go to see the guru. And, um, and so if Rebbe Elimelech, his teacher, formed the doctrine of the tzaddik, the Chosami Lublin kind of became the very paradigm of that tzaddik, the very paradigm of one part of what we think Hasidus is, and in fact, the part that um, the Mitnadim, the anti-Hasidic uh, forces, were most agitated by. It was just like the emphasis on the tzaddik. So that was really true with the Chosami Lublin. He was this, he was more than anything else, he was a holy man. And, and by all accounts, a very holy man. That is, it's not, you're not gonna hear a backstory where he was actually corrupt and dominant. Like, Everybody who met him seems to agree he was incredibly humble, self-effacing, and had like just a, like seemed to be in touch with God. Just had a godly presence. He seemed to, that relationship seemed, seemed easy and intuitive for him. Um, but he also was, was a guru with like a, a cult-like following of just um, acolytes, to, to, to the point of obsession. And it is also true that he, you know, all of the other trappings of that kind of world, like amulets and special blessings and just being in his presence, like there's something, of, we have to understand the break here in light of the fullest expression of this kind of wild, Oh, look at the guru, he is the one, he's, he's touched by God, it's all about him. Um, even, even as the people that broke from him were his students who deeply admired him and never rejected him, nevertheless, I think you have to see part of what they did as a kind of reaction to the, the kind of grossest part of what it means for, for a person to be at the center of, of someone's spiritual life, right? Where it really is, there's something, right, like a little idolatrous about that, right? As Jews, I think we feel that intuitively. The Mitnagdim certainly felt that. And I think even some of the Jose's um, students uh, started to feel that um, as well. Though I must say, in reading it, and, and you know, the Jose, of course, never wrote anything down either, like, but some of the things that you will read in the name of the Chose sound like things that are going to be um, typical of the Pshischa school. I mean, here's, here's a, the, the, the seer of Lublin said that God loves the wicked person who knows he is wicked more than the righteous person who knows that he is righteous. Because um, the wicked person who knows that he is wicked is, is at least in touch with the truth and God is the truth. But the righteous person who knows that he's righteous is wrong because nobody's really righteous. And so God hates that person. Okay, that's just an example of a kind of like searing, self-reflective, um, blasting false piety, um, um, uh, and, and sort of inverting what you thought of as righteousness, right? And, and above all, the, the, the emphasis instead being on truth, on being true, and that we're going to see the commitment to truth throughout this school. It's all about authentic. Right? Look at this book, the quest for authentic authenticity, truth, saying what you mean, right? Um, be having integrity. Now, I, what the quote I read is said in the name of the seer of Lublin. So it's clear that there's like he was their teacher, but it's also clear that there's some there was just they had to leave, right? And it was his chief student who left. And now we'll we'll kind of get into it. And his chief student is called, this is a funny name for a Hasidic Rebbe, his chief student is, is called the Yehudi, which means the Jew. And eventually he gets called the Holy Jew. I think that there's a reason that he adopted, most people think that the reason he got this nickname is because his name was also Yaakov Yitzchak, right? <laughs> so he's like the chief disciple of the Chose, but you can't call him Yaakov Yitzchak because that's the Chose, so they just call him like the Jew, you know? Uh, that's one theory on how he, he got the name. Um, so the Yehudi HaKodesh uh, HaKadosh is the 
the, the chief student of the Chosemi Lublin, and then eventually he's the one that leaves in dramatic fashion and, and, go, and founds a new yeshiva, a new community in Peshischa. Um, the, 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 you'll see this spelled differently, but in Yiddish it's pronounced Peshischa, Peshischa. So uh, it's the Yehudi who goes to found the school. It is then Reb Simcha Bunim, who uh, Rabbi Rosen loved so much, that truly brings the school to its greatness. Um, that really was the, the, the Rebbe of the, of the school of Peshischa and is associated with it. And then finally, um, his student, um, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, becomes the most sort of legendary figure of the three. And, um, and it's his story that we'll end with tonight because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wild one. It's a wild one indeed. Um, but let's start, okay, let's start with the Yudi HaKodesh. Um, uh, Akadosh, let's, uh, let me just stop here. I've been rambling on for a while with introduction. Anyone have any questions or want to clarify anything before we start looking at sayings attributed to these, these thinkers? Okay, in we go. Um, all right, so let's take a look at, this is, I have to say, the, like the material here is thin, and especially for the Yehudi, the Jew <laughs> who started this, uh, it's very, very, very thin, but I picked a couple of examples that I think are, are indicative, are helpful. We're going to spend most of our time with the Kotzker, a little bit more with Zim Chabonim, and very little time on the Yehudi, who is notable to us for the most part because he's the one that made the break. Right? So there's, he yeah. is, he, he, let me just understand, he is simultaneously the person who was the student of the Chose and the person who left. Yeah, Allison. Um, okay, so just... I should have asked this when you invited us. Can you, I, I guess my, my curiosity before we get into this is to understand the extent to which what we're about to learn also relates to like what I'll call mainstream Judaism, like Ikar Judaism, compared to like a different branch of Judaism from what quote unquote we are. Mm. That's an interesting question. I I thought you were going to say from differs from mainstream Hasidut. Is it mainstream Hasidut? Okay. But you're saying how is it different from, from us and, and who we are? Yeah. I, I guess I, the reason I don't understand that, you mean like, does what we're going to study tonight differ from us in a way? What, what about all the other stuff we've studied? Like, well, I guess, like all the how other are you positioning Ikar? I'm not sure it's a mainstream Jewish school, but how are you positioning it? How do you think of it with, with respect to Hasid, Hasidut in general? It seems to me, yeah, maybe I'm not asking the right question, but it seems to me to answer that, that, um, you know, we're not chassidut in the, sense that, in the sense that we don't wear, like, black hats and all these things, but I think spiritually, a lot of the members of the Ikar congregation do connect with. Right. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Well, I think I, 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 it'd be hard for me to answer that question precisely, but I do think that a big part of what we're looking at today is a movement from thinking about spirituality as getting in touch with God to a, a, a way of thinking about spirituality as getting in touch with yourself. And in that sense, you know, you can just, you can decide like, where do we see the trends of seeking some spirit or force like i don't you know i don't know how to map that onto like california but yeah. like but this might actually be what we're looking at tonight might be the the ground on which a kind of a more modern and even dare i say humanist conception of judaism begins that is a, a kind of um i'm not sure if it's how to think about ikar in these terms but there's something very modern about it in that it really is a kind of existential individual experience. Does that make sense? It's about like thinking about me and who am I and how do I be in the world, right? So those, those formulations are in some ways more akin to a, a mainstream modern Jew than some of the other Hasidic stuff that we've been looking at just in so far as the other stuff was so God-centric. Cool, thank you for starting that. Yeah. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, 
so when you were talking about like with the word guru, I just learned in Sanskrit, it, it breaks down to goo darkness and ru light, which I had never known. So I'm wondering the Hebrew word that you used, what the like roots are, since I know there's can usually be so many meanings when you break down the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should stop using the word guru. It's just we did that at one point and then I thought it was a helpful, but it is different. And the word in Hebrew is sadik, mm -hmm. and it means a, a righteous person. Okay. And by, you know, in this usage, it's like, an exceptionally righteous person. Someone I just happened to learn this video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, um, so let's let's get going. Let's let's take a look at the Yudi Akodesh, Akadosh. I keep saying Akodesh, but it's Akadosh. It's an adjective. Um, and here's okay. This this first teaching, I gotta say, it's not it's not mind blowing as some of the other teachings will be, but it's 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 in, it's emblematic uh, in certain ways. Um, now you can see these things are all in the name of. So someone uh, a, a, a generation later is saying, I once heard from the UD that if a person who is serving God sees within himself that today is just like yesterday and that he serves God in exactly the same fashion as he did the day before, he should know indeed that he has fallen from his original level. His mere repetition in his service today detracts and diminishes the value of his service from the day before. For a person is always in the aspect of becoming not of standing. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna spend a ton of time analyzing these first couple of pieces, but I just, I, they're there to give you a taste. I mean, in some ways, that's not so surprising. We might have seen something like that in earlier um, Hasidic thought, this idea that a person's service of God is important and a person should reflect on their service of God. But there is something about it that, that feels typical of this school and that it's really about self-development and that you're in the process of constantly working on yourself, right? That will become a, ma a major theme, okay? But actually- Rabbi, David? Yeah. Rabbi David, I, I, I sort of love that starting off that, with that because it's almost like looking at the concept of every day, um, Hashem is recreating the, uh, every moment. It's, it's the recreating of the mm -hmm. world. And so um, if we are in the image you know, if it's a theme that that we should be each day unique. We each a new. We should be born anew. We should see Torah with new a new lens. We should so that if so if we're seeing exactly as yes, yesterday, then we don't fall into this line of thinking of that we're in constantly uh, just in the name of of, of Hashem. We're in a state of potential, and we mm. should be in feeling like being in the state of potential. Uh, you, know, you know, I, I, I love what you've done with it, Tali, because I think that there's now, you know, I sort of threw it out and I did say, oh, this seems pretty typical. But the, in, in your framing, I think you can actually, you can hear the bridge between the earlier and the later formula, Hasidic formulations, right? I, it seems right to think that earlier Hasidic uh, writings would have focused on the, the constant regeneration of existence itself. God renews the world at all times. The world is in a state of becoming. And you're right. This is like shifting from thinking about the world to thinking about, well, I'm a little world in myself. Right. And I am the God of my own Olam world. Olam Katan. So think about Olam Katan, as you said. Yeah, yeah. So I, that's nice, actually. That's a, that's a very helpful... I sort of threw it out there and was going to blow by it, but I think you, you deepened it. Does anyone else want to deepen it before we, we move forward? Okay, thanks for that. Um, the next piece that we're going to look at from the Houdi is even pithier. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of pith here. <laughs> it's even pithier, but um, but it's actually really important um, because for all of the other things that we're going to talk about, we're not going to be focusing on this that much. But one of the defining features of the U the Yehudi in particular, and in some ways, this is his greatest legacy, is that he really insisted on the centrality of Torah study. And, um, and I think um, it must be said that the Chose of Lublin, the seer of Lublin, was also a very typical Hasidic Rebbe in the ways that, that their detractors um, would, uh, would describe, in that he was known for his exceptional holiness and piety, and not so much for his learning. He wasn't a scholar. That wasn't the point. And goodness, it doesn't have to be, does it? But in a Jewish framework, there's a tension there. Right? Certainly, Hasidim was rebelling against um, an, a, a form of Judaism where it was all scholarship. And the UD 
kind of brought that back, brought serious Torah learning. We noted that there were some geniuses in earlier generations, but as a school, this focus, and here's just one example, the, probably the most famous expression of it, is that he, he is known to have said that learning Gemara and Tosfos, meaning Talmud and its commentaries, purifies the mind and makes one ready for prayer. Now, that's a very nice thing to say, but it has to be understood in its context, which is that with Hasidim kind of claiming prayer and the mitnadim being defined by Torah, there was this sense that there were two forces in Judaism and they were, they were sort of, you either had your, you either had your investment in devotion, prayer, or in learning. And it was actually a big move, move for the UD to say, no, no, there are two, as he sometimes put, two wings. You need both learning and prayer. And in this formulation, learning is the thing which gets your mind ready for prayer, right? Now, that's significant and striking just as a move in itself. It will define a lot of what was happening in Peshischa, where like Torah scholar, Talmud scholarship was as essential as um, davening. But it also um, is important because it, it does, it does, I think it's a part of one other, like the, the, I think the final key to understanding some major break away from the earlier school, which is that um, Torah studies, learning, Talmud, all that stuff, the basic core Jewish study, as opposed to Kabbalah. And you are not going to find in the, well, writings of Peshischa, but the record of Peshischa, you're not going to find these Rebbe's talking about the mystical spheres or the tzimtzum or the, none of that stuff appears in at least the record of their school. It was as if they demystified Hasidus. Right? Now, their school will have all kinds of kind of cryptic and, but, and, and, and mind-bending formulations, but it's not rooted as everything we've seen before is, and as the Chosemi Lublin was, in real Kabbalah. Okay, so that's, a, that's also a huge difference. What does it mean to have Hasidic thought without Kabbalah? Like what's the, what is that? What's the, um, the, 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 the excessive spiritual, where does it go if it's not mystical? Okay. All right, so that's, that's the UD, and that's about all we're going to get from the UD. He's the kind of least recorded of these three figures. We're not going to head to Reb Sim Chabunim, his, pro, his he, well, I say protege, he also left, um, Lublin with the UD, was part of that movement. And then when the UD died, he became the Rebbe, and he really was the Rebbe. They called him the Rebbe Reb Simcha Bunim, right? The, the, the Rebbe Reb Simcha. Like, the, he's the, Re, the, Reb, the Rebbe Rabbi, you know? He's an es, especially a, a Rebbe. And he really created, in some ways, another court uh, that was like a kind of a rival to the court at Lublin. Okay, so, um, what do we learn from the from, from Simcha Bonim? Well, there are some famous teachings. We're going to see one very famous teaching. Um, but before we get there, um, I want to, it's also not, you know, his writing. So these are just stories. I thought the best story by far for really getting us into the heart of our, of the matter tonight is a story that um, I found in, this is another great reference work, the Tales, Tales of the Hasidim by Martin Buber. Um, great because it's so, like, he just really covers all the legends from all of these Hasidic thinkers. Um, and he's got, he's got legends of Rav Simcha, of the UD, of the Kutzker in here, and I got it from out of here. But I will say, uh, Buber doesn't, Buber's telling these stories that he found. So there's no, it's a little hard to know um, how authentic they are. And in fact, the story that I'm about to tell you is, 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 is not just debated uh, in, in that it's sometimes attributed to different Hasidic rabbis. You'll hear this sometimes um, attributed to Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Um, but also, I found an incredible article, I'll share it with you right now, that gives all, there are like tens of versions of this story where the cities change and the rabbis change, and then eventually, you know how these things go once you start going down this rabbit hole, eventually, uh, they find that this story is like, oh, there are versions of it in Arabic, and then it goes back to like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. So like, people have always been telling this story, but it is the one attributed to Reb Simcha Bunim in, 
um, in, in Tales of the Hasidim. And I, th that attribution itself, in a, in a world where we're in a landscape where we're not, we don't have any real hardcore sources, um, it's worth reading this because the very fact, here's, the, here's the, the one that traces it back to like, I think, 1001 uh, Arabian Nights. Um, okay. But, but let's look at the one version. You may have even heard this story before, just as a Hasidic tale, but it's framed in, in Buber's collection as something that Rav Bunim would tell everybody who came to Peshischa, all the students who came seeking the Torah of Peshischa. Okay. Um, so this, this story will read, uh, I'm not gonna do all the talking tonight. This story will read, and then I, and I wanna like, hear your analysis of it, okay? Um, What's the moral of the story, in other words? Okay, the holy Rebbe Rabbunim, here it is, that's how he gets over it. Rebbe Rabbunim of Peshischa used to tell those who came to him to become his students the following story. And this is a great one. I have to say, I looked at the various versions and I picked the one that was like, just punchy, the best, the best writing. This is just like a, this is, this is a really exaggerated version. Um, he used to tell his students the following story. In the city of Krakow is a shul called Rebbe Yitzchak Yekel Shul after the man who built it. His story is as follows. Rabbi Yitzchak was a very poor man who lived in Krakow. One night, he had a dream in which he was shown that there was a very large treasure buried near a big bridge in the city of Prague. He was shown all the surroundings so that he could recognize it. When it was morning, he decided to ignore the dream since after all, most dreams are just foolishness. But he had it again the next night and continued to have it. He finally could not hold himself back and he set out to Prague to see if there was any truth in the dream. When he got there, he saw the bridge exactly as it had been in his dream and he could even recognize where the treasure was buried. But there was a problem. The bridge was near a palace which, surrounded, which was surrounded by guards who didn't look like they would be so happy to let him start digging a hole there. So every day he went out to look around to see the bridge and maybe some idea would come to him as how he could get the treasure that was there. After a few days of this, the guards began to suspect him. After all, what purpose is there for a Jew to come and look around the palace every day? So the head of the guards came over to him and, and said, Jew, what do you want here? So Rabbi Yitzchak explained to him his dream and the purpose of him coming. After hearing the story, the guard broke out in bellowing laughter that could be heard in the whole city of Prague. You stupid Jews, said the guard. If I was as foolish as you following my dreams after buried treasure, you know what I would have done? I would have gone to Krakow and dug under the oven of some Jew named Yitzchak, the son of Ye Yekel. Why half the Jews are called Yekel, Yitzchak and the other half are called Yekel? How stupid you Jews are. On hearing the words of the guard, he replied, yes, I suppose you are correct. Thank you for setting me straight. I shall now return home. <laughs> so he returned home and dug under his oven and found a huge treasure. With it, he built the shul. Okay, now, the question is, why did Riz Chabunim tell this story to his students? What, what's, what's the point of the story? Why is this the message that you get when you come to the town of Pshischa? Any thoughts? Alexander, you've got a thought. I think it's about... Um how God works in sort of unexpected ways and situations that we think are hopeless are often just the miracle we're looking for and that God's directions are sometimes strange and if they seem like pressing enough to follow them like the dream coming so many times that you can't ignore it there and then you get there and it seems impossible like don't give up because god has a way of surprising us and thing the world is magical and it doesn't it doesn't look like it always that's what i think okay that's absolutely true those themes are certainly um threaded throughout this story but that but the but those those um lessons it's that you could have learned from earlier Hasidic stories. Those, those things are kind of classic. These, in other words, I think you identified ways in which this is a classically Hasidic story, and no surprise it's told about all kinds of Hasidic rebbies. But, but I want to dig a little further, some dig, literally. Um, there, there's, 
there's something about this school, the, 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 about this story that really speaks to, remember, you come to my yeshiva and I'm like, okay, you want to study this yeshiva? Let me tell you this story. What's, what's going on there? Liz, you've got a thought. It, it hits me very much like in The Wizard of Oz where she learns at the end that there's no place like home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's sort of about the looking within to find the answer. Good, good. Okay. There's something that's happening in the story where the person goes looking, but then has to go home to find what, what he's looking for. And now if I'm telling you that as you've come to study at my yeshiva, that's interesting because part of what I'm saying is it's not, you haven't come, if you've come to find something, it's not here, right? Where is it? It's, it's, it's in your own, it's, well, let's continue to speak it out. Where, where is it? Where is, where's the treasure? Uh, other thoughts, Rachel, and then Yonatan. Um, it reminded me of this idea of like divinity, when you look outside of it, you, you don't have to look outside of it because it's already there all along. It's within you. It's where you were. That was. Yeah, yeah, good. So, so that the, this is now, this is a Hasidic Rebbe, right, using, um, using Rachel's language, saying to, um, saying to his student, it's not in me, it's in you. Your answers are to be found within yourself. Now, that's a bold spiritual message altogether. But it's especially so coming from a Hasidic, you think you're coming for the, the Rebbe? Get out, get over it. It's not, that's not about me. You're not, I'm not the one who's going to help you find what you need to find. You're the one who's going to help you find what you need to find. Yonatan? It doesn't seem like just coincidence that the Rabbi's name is Yitzchak, right? Uh -huh. he, he's coming from, he's just left a congregation whose last two leaders were named Yitzchak, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it seems like a little bit of a dig. A dig at the, at the, at the Jose, of the, the, yes. the, the, the Yitzchak who was, right. And I think that's right. I think that this is a kind of commentary on exactly the way people have now learned to, to go, to make pilgrimage to a Hasidic. People went to Lublin just to catch a sight of the Rebbe, just to be in his presence. That, that's, that's what Hasidus was becoming, right? So this school, growing up within Hasidus, is saying there's something that's going wrong, right? As, as, as Yonatan calls it, a dig, but a deep dig. Again, no pun intended. Um, but there's something going wrong here. This is not, this isn't Judaism. This isn't what it's about. This is not how you performed it. You have to, you have to look inside yourself. The answers that you need to find ultimately will, will be found inside your soul. Okay, Todd? There's something troubling, though, about the, the fact that he has to be told this by the guard, by an anti-Semite, by, by a Shagetz, to go yeah. back. And it, it sounds like almost a pejorative the rabbi is using that, like, if you think you're finding the answers, you need some dumb goy to tell you to go back home and find the answer. I, it's interesting, and I don't know if that's because He's taking a shot at these other followers, people who are coming to him. And like, but why specifically use that device of the soldier, the guard? That's that's a it's a good question, right? Um, there is something. Uh, so 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 I, you're making me feel like I made the wrong choice. I chose the version that was the, the most sort of like wild and scintillating. But the truth is, if you go back to um, if you go back to uh, this book. The version is a little different. Uh, first of all, it includes, um, take this at the end, take this story to heart, Rabbanon used to add, and make what it says your own. There is something you cannot find anywhere in the world, not even at the Tzadik's place, and there is nevertheless a place where you can find it. So he's like sort of speaks it out. I didn't want to give all that to you. But uh, more to Todd's point, uh, in this version of the story, it says finally the captain of the guards who had been watching him asked in a kindly way whether he was looking for something or waiting for somebody. That's very different. And I think Todd's right. If you tell the story this way, it's almost like the Rebbe is a fool. The Rebbe's nothing. The Rebbe's like just some brute. Like d this version of the story, right, if this was the version that he told, and again, we're just sort of playing with variations here. If this is the story he told, he's, 
there's a way in which he's saying, the Rebbe's will seduce you. They will confuse you. They don't even know what, who you are, right? Whereas in the version, it's not surprising that the Buber records, Rav Simcha is saying like the guard is, listen, let me just tell you something. But, but, in, but what's striking um, is that in both versions, the mean guard or the kindly guard, they don't know what they're saying, right? In either version, even the guard is nicer, the guard still doesn't understand that what he's about to say is a revelation. And that I think is the key insight, is that like your Rebbe's will say things and they'll teach you and it'll be nice and maybe sometimes they're kindly and maybe sometimes they're full, full of it, but you'll understand when you hear the message you need to hear, you'll get that. So yeah, you're right. It, it, like, it's a strange story to just sort of import as a kind of a, an allegory for, for Hasidic uh, learning and seeking. Uh, okay, any other thoughts there? I think we've, we've done some good work on that. Okay, all right, so that's Rav Simcha Bonham. Uh, Rav Simcha Bonham has another teaching, a very famous teaching. This one, I think, is mostly attributed to him. Um, uh, you've probably heard this one before, but let's just like finish our, our time with, uh, with this legendary uh, man with his probably most legendary teaching, um, and is the teaching of two pockets. Every person, he said, should have two pockets so that they can reach into one or the other according to their needs. In one pocket is a note that says, the world was created for me. And in the second pocket is a note that says, I am but dust and ashes. Have you heard the two pockets? You heard this? Rouse talks about it a lot. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's become a classic. Every person should have a note in each pocket. One says, the world was created for me. And the other one says, I am but dust and ashes. Now. Okay, what's the point of that story? Somebody give me a little, why, why carry these two, two around? To remember that you're important, but not that important. Okay, to remember both things. Remember that you are important, remember that you are not, not important. Other people? So there will be... Who's speaking? I didn't... Sorry, it was Beth. Um, there, will be, there will be times where... One, one of the, one pocket will serve you well, and there'll be times where another pocket will serve you well. Good, yeah, that's the addition here, and I hadn't heard it that way until I read it in Boober's um, version. That actually, it's not, it's the two pockets coexist, and sometimes you'll need to lean a little bit on like, listen, I have great importance. This is my moment. And sometimes you'll have to lean on the other pocket. Like, you'll have to oscillate between those two values. But they're both values. There's a, there are times in your life where you have to think, my journey, what I do, my service, it's, it's critically important. And there are other times where you have to say, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. And, 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 and I will say as a footnote, um, the Jose of Lublin was famous for saying I'm nothing. That was like one of his big statements, is a person really needs it. And it's, it's something that we've actually seen in Hasidic thought um, for a while, that like the ultimate is to realize that you don't even exist. Simcha Bonim is not saying that. He's saying sometimes you diminish yourself. Sometimes you realize you're important and you exist and you have meaning, right? The self, the kind of the prominence of the self and self-knowledge and self-investigation and, a, and a, a correct perception of yourself. Correct both in the sense that you don't think you're a big shot, but also that you don't think you're worthless because that's not correct either. Know yourself. Know yourself well. And that requires a kind of balancing it. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts? Jennifer. Well, I was, uh, it's Oh, I'm Tali. sorry, Polly and then Jennifer. Yeah, I was, because I just um, really was, what you just said is to, like a scale, that you have to keep, um, a, you know, you can't go up too much and one way too much. You have to be, it's just a beautiful thing to keep that scale because it's very easy, especially uh, for a student, to feel that he's not worthy. Uh, it's very easy, and it's to remind you have self-importance, but also that can't be the point that it it becomes uh, it consumes you. So neither should con consume you. That you have to walk in this uh, in this path of balance. That all the time when you're learning, it's uh, you know I think about being in in a in a, in a root of part, especially in the in, in a shiva setting. That ah, I have so much to tell you. No, you know you have to step back and. It's, uh, I think about the Netzach and Hood, it's just being in the middle 
balancing those those two. Okay, and that's important. What you're saying is important too, because that means that it's not just knowing yourself. It's not just being tuned into yourself. It's that it, the, the work of self-knowledge is this constant like, well, now a little bit like this, and now a little bit like this. And you, you're like, it's a process, right? You're in this process of becoming, right? We read that. <laughs> Just, that's, that's constant work. Knowing yourself takes constant, constant reflection, self-evaluation. What about the other hand? What about the other hand? Right. Um, Jennifer, now, is this so different from everybody else at the time? I'm sorry to jump in. Was this a novel idea? Know. Oh, Todd, hi. Was it different from? This, I'm sorry, just context. Was this a novel idea among, among Rebbe's at this time? I don't know, but I do think that there's, like everything has to be seen as a kind of reaction to, to the Hasidus that Prashischa broke away from. So it, that I, I, I suggested one way in which this does seem novel, like all this emphasis on the self is nothing. And here you're saying the self is really something. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm going to take it back. I, I do think it would. I think that this is a, this is a twist. This is a turn. This is like a move. This emphasis on like the importance of the self, I think is one of the great contributions. As, as opposed to being, we are all subjects of God and we are all here to adore God and God. That's right. That's we right. all adore God. But this is more about, think about yourself. It's like psychology, you know, it's more like, like some little therapy here. You, let's, let's be introspective and not just be thinking about how we can praise God. Yeah. I mean, yes, yes, that's right. I, I you know, I want to just, just because we've gotten to this point, we should say it already. We're, we'll head into the Kutzker soon. But there's one line that's attributed to the Kutzker that, like, says everything we've been saying in, in his usual kind of pithy, precise way. This is really what we're talking about. The Kutzker is, um, is uh, known for saying people are accustomed to looking upwards at the heavens and wondering what happens there. It would be better if they would look inwards to see what happens there. So it's like that's the... The Kutzka really puts it in those stuff. Like, stop worrying about God. Ah, what do you know? Worry about yourself. Who are you? What are you dealing with? What's going on inside you? That's what. That's your work in the world, right? And that that does feel does feel new. Um, Jennifer, uh, I saw your hand. Yeah. Yeah. So about having the two notes, I was thinking kind of like what Tali was saying that I think you're. It's, he's saying that you're supposed to have both at the same time. That you're supposed to realize that you have this divine part in you so that you're part of God, but at the same time, you're supposed to be selfless and bitter, like Moses, being like, you know, knowing, knowing your value and that you have this mission, um, but in the same time to be humble. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, uh, let me just like pause for a minute to deepen this teaching even further because Rav Simcha Banamak actually is doing something quite brilliant here that usually doesn't get noticed, which is that this line, um, I, uh, I, am the, I am but dust and ashes. Who says that? Abraham says that. But Abraham says that when he's arguing with God. So at the moment when Abraham is actually being most bold and sort of full of his own conviction. He says, I'm but dust and ashes. And then this other thing, the world was created for me, that appears in a mission in Sanhedrin that says everybody is stamped with the same stamp of, of the image of God so that every person knows their greatness and can say that, the, but that's, that's an irony too. It's like the world is created for me at the moment that you recognize that you're just like everybody else. So they're both of these phrases are sort of purposely taken out of their context and used as opposing forces when in fact, in their context, they're sort of opposing forces in the other way, right? So just, just to give a sense of like, these are pithy little things, but there's, there's real depth in, in them. They're meant to sort of spin your brain around. Um, Kathy, what are you, uh, what are you thinking? S sort of a question about a, a different point. I would, I, and it's getting back to the uh, story from Boober, but um, okay, so I was, so, um, when you were talking about the Yehudi, the Jose, is that what you called him? Uh, the, yeah, the Holy, the Holy Jew. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then he's he's like bringing back uh, um, learning Talmud and 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 commentaries as being central, and you were going through that. But that seemed to me to be a real, a really big departure from what what the original Hasidic, Hasidic teachings were about 
because I remember, you know, it was like, oh, anyone can do this. This is accessible to everyone. And you don't have to be, you know, like in a lit rock and, you know, and devote your life to that, that kind of study. It, it, so anyway, so it seemed to be a real departure. But the story seems to be going back to the original, like it's saying, no, you don't need the, you know, the teachers so much. And so I'm wondering, I, is, is that, it seems yeah. like a statement about, you know, the tradition, the need for traditional learning is the one that's kind of the outlier, you know, yeah. but I don't, I, I don't know quite where, where this is all going. Um, right. I mean, I think another way to, to, to say what you're saying is that there's something about this that doesn't, doesn't feel very Hasidic at all. It feels like a sort of a return from Hasidus, like not a new development in Hasidus. And I think that that's right. I think there's some question as to just like, were they just like fed up with Hasidim the way that the, the Mitnagdim were fed up with Hasidim and just like, let's get back to just learning and don't think so much about God and don't think about, um, yeah, I, I think one way to read this is that it's like, it's Hasidut beginning to, uh, to die. Like that, that one way to read this is that like Hasidic energy was this wild swirling thing which took place for a few generations, but sort of it, it overextended itself. And then when even with its own ranks began to say, well, this is, this is going too far. Let's get back to basics. That is one way to look at it. Yeah, except that the story, um, you know, about the, tre the treasure and digging for it, it seems to me as going, it's, it seems to me as going back to the original Hasi, Hasi, Hasidic teaching. Yeah, of yeah, I think you're right. I think that, oh, sorry, I just said one way to read this is that like Hasidus is self critiquing I think I'm more inclined to read this as these are people who are saying, let's get back, let's get back to what this is really about. It's oh, really okay. about serving God. It's like, forget about all the mystical, magical people and potions and incantations. It's like, ugh, all the Kabbalah, it's just confusing people. In some ways, that's a response to the, the, the simple Jews. But let's just like, just think about who you are, how you can be of service to God right now in this world. Yeah. Okay, um, I have to move forward because I, this is always that. Anytime you, I could hear myself saying it, we're gonna spend most of our time on the Kutzker. You just know you're gonna rob the Kutzker of his, of his time. Um, but let's now turn to the Kutzker because the Kutzker is, is kind of actually the legend. Kutzker sort of represents something that is, he wasn't the biggest of these three rabbis, but he sort of epitomized something. And he's also very, it's very like thin that the actual record of what he said, but there's so many stories in his name, so many quotations. I saw in Chabad and you can Google this, like sayings of the Kutzker, and they have like 49 pit wise statements of the Kutzker. And they're just like sentences, 49 things that he said, right? Um, so here's a, here's a, here are a couple, right? We just saw one. Um, the Kutzker said um, that people are accustomed to looking upwards at the heavens and wondering what happens there. It would be better if they would look inwards, see what happens there. Um, I, I, here's another one that both gives you a sense of who he was and also gives you a sense of why we don't have any of his writing. This is a famous thing that he said. He said, not all that is thought needs to be said. Not all that is said needs to be written. Not all that is written needs to be published, and not all that is published needs to be read. So that is important, I think, because one, I don't have enough time to do a full lead into like, who was the Kutzker, where did he come from? He was the disciple of Reb Simcha Bunim, but I think that if Reb Simcha Bunim, um, You've seen this sort of self-introspective work is that is a part of all of these thinkers. But if Rav Simcha Bonham said, on the one hand, I'm but dust and ashes, but on the other hand, the world was created for me, I think that the Kutzker is just all, all dust and ashes all the time. You know? I mean, there was something, the Kutzker is, you're going to notice there's a certain kind of severity. A certain, he's the guy, the, when they tell Hasidic stories and the Rebbe says something like, clever and, and almost like insulting that just devastates you because you never thought about that before. That's the Kutzker. There's a kind of a sharpness, a severity to the Kutzker that is different from his predecessors. 
And in some ways, he is the epitome of what we, are, what we have been talking about tonight, about a, a kind of a Hasidist that isn't really even about theory. It's just about like a, 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 a remark that cuts right to the quick and tells you that everything you've been thinking and, and, and trying to do is just, is just BS, okay? So here's an example. Here's a, I'm gonna, there's some famous Kutzker quotes and we're gonna look at a couple of them. Um, and then we'll end with a famous Kutzker story that isn't on your page. Okay, so here's an example. This I think actually is one that, that is worth analyzing. And again, I got these from Buber's Tales of the Chassidim, but I've heard them a million times before. Where does God dwell? This was the question with which the rabbi of Kutz surprised a group of learned visitors. They laughed at him. What, is, what a thing to ask. Is not the whole world full of God's glory? Then he answered his own question. God dwells wherever a person lets God in. Okay, now what's the point of that story? What, what, what's, why is that the, one of the famous quotations? What's the, what is, God, where does God dwell? God dwells wherever a person lets God in. What's that mean? Why does it, well, uh, there was another answer on the table. It was like, God's everywhere. But Kutzker's not saying that. Sorry, who did I cut off just now? Oh, I said, build a temple and I will live among them, right? It's the difference between God doing the work and you doing the work. Oh, okay. So that's nice. That's a nice comment, Yontan, know, because you're saying, this is, this is sources. There's an idea that we construct space that allows God to come into the world. But you do the work, I think, is, is, is the real emphasis here. That, that part of what he's saying is, you know, we've been talking so much in Hasidus about how do you experience God? How do you know God? How do you access God? How do you figure out what God is? All that. It seems that like what the Kutzker is saying is like, do you know why you can't know God? Because of you. You're the problem. You're not letting, God's everywhere. Yeah, of course God is everywhere, but that's obvious. But why don't you feel God? Why don't you see God? Because you've got a problem. Because of your ego. Because of your small-mindedness. Right? Kutzker, you could just say Kutzker sings all night, but is also reported to have said, someone who does not see God everywhere cannot see God anywhere. Right? But again, that's sort of like, it's your problem. You open your eyes. Liz, what are you thinking? It's an interesting inversion of the original Hasidic thinking where God had to make room for people. You know, it had to create the whole, and now it's like, we need to create no, it, it, it's this weird inverted snake, you know? Ooh, I love that, love that. That's great. This, that's exactly right. I never thought of it that way, but that's, a, that's I'm, ne I'm never gonna see it, see it uh, else, else, elsewise again. This is like our tzimtzum. We have to contract. God already contracted. Now we have to contract to let God in. I love that. That's, yeah, that's a, and, and it's, it's beautiful because it is kind of like an inversion of those original core concepts, right? But in inverting, it's like exactly as I said, stop worrying about God, worry about yourself, and then you will experience God, right? You're the obstacle, you're the problem. And, and here you get a little bit of his like, his harshness, and we're gonna need to keep this harshness in mind because um, his story ends in a very harsh way. Okay, let's look at one more, we usually go till 9.15, everybody's with me on that. Um, we, um, let's look at one more uh, text that is, I think it's like the best Kutsk text. It's like, this is the, one of the, there's three or four that just get tossed around all the time. And this one's like, wow. And, and I said, he's known for his pithy sayings. Um, I, I have a colleague who um, referred to them as, as koans. Like it's a, the sort of like Zen koan. Like there's something kind of elliptical and kind of dizzying about this. But if you think about it for a while, you reach enlightenment kind of, kind of saying. So, um, I debated whether or not to give you Buber's introduction here, because I think it kind of colors, sometimes this is taken out of context and just the quote, but nah, I don't know, it's a little hard to understand. So I, 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 here's Buber's lead in. Someone once told Rabbi Mendel, that's Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kutsk, that a certain person was greater than another, whom he also mentioned by name. Now, this rabbi is greater than that rabbi. Rabbi Mendel replied. So there's the context that Buber's giving it. You can, you can decide how to read this um, we can analyze it for a, for a little bit, either in or out of context. Okay, the Kutzke replied, if I am I, because I am I, 
and you are you because you are you. Then I am I and you are you. But if I am I because you are you and you are you because I am I, then I am not I and you are not you. Okay. So what's he mean by that? <laughs> so it's like, this is like, this is what I mean by it. it's like, it's kind of Zen and it's also like, um, Buber uh, and, and Shalom and Gershom Shalom were in this conversation about the Kutzker and Shalom claimed he wasn't a Hasid at all. Like there's nothing Hasidic about this, right? He's just off on some other own weird spiritual journey, right? Um, and yet Hasidus becomes known for these sorts of sayings as well. So what is he saying here? If I am I because I am I and you are you because you are you, then I am I and you are you. But if I am I because you are you and you are you because I am I, then I am not I and you are not you. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Anyone? Dane is, I see Dane is just shaking her head like, I don't know. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone got me here? Yeah, Rachel. Like looking at it like an actual math problem, it's like you, you, if you compare yourself to someone else, then you're somehow not, you're no longer yourself, sort of was what I could get from it. That's definitely part of it. If I define myself through you, then I'm not myself. That's not, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing, right? So far we've been talking about don't worry about God. Also, don't worry about other people. Don't compare yourself. That's not, when you, this self invest gets nothing to do with what that guy's doing, what that gal's doing. Todd, what, what do you think? I, yeah, I have a similar notion is that we exist because of the way we are in relation to others. In the same way that we can say God will exist because he is in relation to how we perceive him. You know, if we did not perceive him, would God exist? Would I exist if, but for your perception of me? And so if that's the case, then you won't, don't exist because you can't exist only because of other people. You have to exist because of you. That's... We, we don't have to exist in the context of the other. You know what I'm saying? We don't, we don't, we should not exist because we are in a relative relationship with others. You know, that's a very helpful comment. And I am, um, I'm thinking about it also in light of some of the other comments that have suggested there is a kind of pushback against the, I'm nothing, um, I only stand in relationship to God. Like there was a kind of like, who are we anyway? And we only understand ourselves in, re in relation. And, and so there is this way that the whole school of Peshischa is like, no, you have a self. You need to look into that self, analyze that self, think about when that self should be aggrandized and when it should be contained. But importantly, it's not just don't worry so much about God, but also like the, the, the knowledge of self takes place inside. It doesn't, it's not in dialogue with that, oh, well, but Todd, Todd doesn't think I'm cool. So maybe I'm not cool. Like, no, it's that I, I'm just who I am. Just know yourself, turn inside yourself, right? I think that yeah, that's part of it as well. Um, okay, any, any, any last if I am I and you are you um, thoughts here? I hope you have a little bit of feeling for who the Kutsk is. I hope you have a little bit of a sense for the kind of um, severe, but kind of penetrating. I mean, the Kutsker really became known for these, like, you know, these sort of slicing comments that sort of undermined everything that you would, you know, they came in and they said, oh, God is everywhere. And he's like, no, God's not everywhere because we don't let God be everywhere, right? So work on yourself. So work on your, get, go inside yourself. Now, Okay, um, I want to end with a, with the with the story that the Kutzker, uh, the that that is told about the Kutzker, um, and again, various pieces of it in different locations. There are various versions of it, and it's almost like I didn't even write it down because there's almost like a tradition not to not to talk about, not to write it down. Um, it's cloaked in kind of ha in hazy kind of mystery, um, but I think you have a sense that. The movement of Peshischa was a movement to really focus on the self and to do so in an unflinchingly honest way. That's the idea. Be true. True to yourself. True with your words. True in your self-evaluation. Honest. Serious. Right? Don't attach yourself to other things, other ideas, other grand notions, other systems of mysticism or other... Right? Just, just go inside yourself and be true and, and authentic. Right? And we assume that the Kutzker did that work. We assume the Kutzker was always self-analyzing and that as harsh as he was with everybody else, he was even harsher with himself. Um, and that is, that's the, 
that's the Kutzker that we have to imagine leading a group of Hasidim. And, um, and you can imagine what it's like for someone who believes that it's all BS, all of this pomp and ceremony, and that most of human life is just people self-aggrandizing, let alone Hasidic Rebbe's. And then you become a Hasidic Rebbe and everybody worships you and everybody chases you around and everybody wants to know what you're gonna say, right? You can imagine a person like that, it's like his very being becomes a kind of hypocrisy. You could have said it about Rav Simcha Bonim also. There's a way in which Rav Simcha Bonim created the same thing that the Chose of Lublin created, right? There's a kind of an irony in this whole story. But with the Kutzker, that irony must have felt particularly sharp, must have felt particularly painful. And as legend has it, over the years, it became more and more cantankerous and, 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 and sharp, but also, you know, I think what we would identify today as, as mentally, like, unstable and more and more isolated from his Hasidim. And just more and more harsher and harsher and harsher and more and more self-penetrating and more and more self-punishing. And then the story is told that, and it's, it's about like that Shabbat. They, they say that what happened that Shabbat, that Friday night? That's the way the, the story is, you know, like, oh, you know, that Shabbat. Sometimes it's just spoken to in, allu in illusion, and sometimes it's actually recorded, and I've seen various versions of it recorded, but the story goes like this. One Friday night, Shabbat, and the Hasidim of, 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 of uh, Peshischa are gathered around, and, um, and they're gathered around, and they're, they're davening Friday night services, and the Kutzker is in his quarters. And that's actually not unusual. There is a Hasidic custom that the Rebbe davens alone on Friday night, sort of reaching up, up around. I've actually seen this happen. The Rebbe kind of comes in after the services because he's been, you're davening with the congregation, but the Rebbe's doing some extra work and then meets with the congregation afterwards to sort of have a tish and sort of share spiritual insights. So the Kutzker is like in his quarters, but you have a sense that like, he's not there to like, he's there just he doesn't want to talk to anyone anyway. So they're waiting afterwards, they're waiting to start the meal and, you know, and it's tense anyway. I mean, the Kutzker's just been unpleasant to be around for, for years now. Um, but he's also the Rebbe, and he's also a master, and he's also clearly, like, tuned into something. So they're waiting, and they're waiting. And finally, the Kutzker comes out, and he no, doesn't look at anyone. And he sits down, and he's silent. And he's silent for a while. And there are Shabbat candles in front of him. I'm gonna I'll tell you a couple versions of the story, but I'm going to tell you the the most, as I like to do, the most shocking version first. And there's Shabbat candles in front of me. He starts staring at the candles. And it's like a little scary. He's just like, just fixating, staring at the candles. And his Hasidim are gathered around. It's like silence. They're waiting for the Rebbe to speak. And in one version of the story, the Kutzker finally looks up and he says, Leit dain v'leit din. There's no judge and there's no justice and he puts out the candles. Like, you have to understand, like the gravity of that is violated Shabbat and said there's no God and no justice in the world. Okay, that's one version of the story. There are other versions of the story in, a, in, a, in probably a more likely version of the story. He just came out of his quarters and he said, who do you think I am? You think I'm your rabbi? I'm not a rabbi, I'm not anyone. Get the hell out of here, get out of my face, right? That's, that's a plausible version of the story as well. But something happened that night, and the reason that the first version, though it's so wild, it's hard to believe, the reason the first version is still kind of considered is because what, something happened that night that caused another rebellion, right? The UD rebelled from the Jose, but um, something happened that night and the whole faction of Hasidim broke off from the Kutzker. Famously, they were led away by Reb Mordechai um, Leiner of Ishpitz, who is the figure that we're going to consider next week. A radical and sh harsh and provocative thinker on his own, nevertheless, seemed to have had enough. This was too far. There's something that Kutzker did that night that, um, that seemed to, that just exploded the whole project. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is that after that night, and this everybody does agree on, he went back into his quarters and stayed there alone for 20 years, for the last 20 years of his life. He is said to have only come out 
once a year on Pesach when he was like getting rid of the of the chametz. And who knows? I mean, maybe that detail is not true. Maybe that's the details. Are, all of this is a little bit like cobbled together. But you do have a sense that there's something about this self-analyzing, self-integrity, um, truth at all costs approach that completely revolutionized um, the Hasidic world and left its lasting legacy. But that it, it also was so intense that it, it, eventually, um, it eventually turned on itself and led the Kutzker into a kind of misery that perhaps is the inevitable bribe byproduct of always asking, like, who am I? Am I living true? Am I doing right? Am I the problem? Am I the, am I the obstacle between me and God? What is God? Where is God? Right? The questions more and more and more and more. And finally, it's just like, this is done. This, this whole thing is done. So that's not the end of Hasidus. Hasidus, like there is a breakaway and there are many, and some people stayed with him even after that, right? That was the power of, of the Kutzker. But it is, uh, a, 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 it is a sharp punctuation on the, on the story of Peshischa, um, which is uh, an important story and in some ways contains some of the energy of Hasidus in healthy ways, but then has its own intense energy that also and I think some, some, some disciples felt um, needed to be stopped or contained. So that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the school of Peshischa. Um, that's a, the major turn um, that I've been alluding to for a while now that really represents a, a sharp break and maybe saved Hasidus from just becoming a kind of a, cult, a series of cult of personalities, um, but also weighed itself alive in a certain way. So here's what we're gonna do. Next week, we'll gather together four that breakaway, the breakaway from the breakaway from um, the Meishi Loach, um, Mordechai Leiner of Ishpitza, who has a, a radical Torah all to, all, 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 all to himself that, um, that will serve for us, I think, probably as the last session for a while. We'll break, we'll, I'm going on vacation in uh, the week after for a couple of weeks. And then when I come back, we'll be in high holiday mode and we'll do most of our learning, we'll focus on, on that. So this class will go on pause until after the holidays and then we'll come back and we still have a lot to study. We still have um, all of the more modern thinkers like Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, like the Sfas Emes that I just mentioned, like the Rebbe, like the Chabad Rebbe, and like, of course, um, the Satma Rebbe, um, which in some ways, um, thanks to Todd and Unorthodox, is, is the sort of the fascination that got us started on this journey in the first place. So uh, I will stay on for another couple of minutes if anyone has questions, but that's your class for tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, right. Yeah, Kathy. I just wonder, is there, are you having a class, the Pure Kea Vote class this Thursday? It no. wasn't on the calendar. Okay. Yes, no. uh, yeah, we're sort of like, sort of shutting down, winding things down for a period of a few weeks when usually we, as, as the rabbis at Ikar, we try to like stagger our vacation. So if people are always around, but because things are so weird this year, we're going to try and take them all at once just to like go off and to be able to come back on to prepare for this weird high holidays that we're, you know, heading into. No Pirkei okay about this week. No Pirkei okay about this week. Okay. 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 The other thing, um, uh, my, my, uh, I should just say by way of advertisement, my, uh, Parsha class and my Mishnah class are staying, but my peer kit, my nighttime class, the peer kevot and Hasidus class, are going on break. Oh, yeah. great. Okay. Oh, you know, when you were saying about fo following the Rebbe's, there, uh, I should send you pictures. There's a very famous, uh, very famous Polish uh, photographer who has been following. She is the only one who is, um, and I became a friend of hers because she came to Palm Beach Synagogue and brought her in t uh, her exhibit of all these Hasidim that go um, to Poland and go from track and she la and she's allowed in, she's the only like woman and has taken these amazing photography of going to all the um, Kevarim of the of the, Re the famous Rebbe. So they're still following these different um, Rebunim that they're, that, that uh, at their yurt site, they're still well, going sure. to Poland. And that's a good example. I didn't, I, I tried, I was trying to come up. Because yeah, I think you're saying they stopped, but they're still like. So visiting, still, the, visiting the graves of Tzadikim is definitely like, I, I can, you can imagine that the Kutzker would have hated it, how many people visit his grave. Just hated it, re revolted at the thought. Okay? That's, that gives you a sense of like, of who he is. He's the guy that's, that's sitting there underneath his grave saying, get away from me, get away from me. Uh, any last thoughts? Okay. All right. Then we'll call it a night. Good to see everyone. Thank you for, uh,
Thank you for being here. We'll meet together one last time next week. Bye. Thank you.